It's been more than 50 years since we've sent a man to the moon, but NASA is preparing a manned moon mission in 2024. NASA announced the names of the astronauts that are going to be part of this mission last month. One of them is Kayla Barron. She's a Pocatello native. She's currently training with the hopes of becoming part of the actual mission. We spoke with her for just a few minutes briefly. Here's our interview. I understand you were um, born in Pocatello, but your home mm -hmm. Actually, Richland, Washington. Yep, that's right. So, how did you live in Pocatello at all? Um, I'm Pocatello for about a year. My big sister was born there too, um, but we moved around a lot as kids. Um, so, I grew up in. Both my parents are from Montana, um, and so lived in Idaho when I was first born, then in Montana and Colorado. But I went through most of middle school and high school in Washington. You were pursuing a career in the Navy. You didn't necessarily start uh, set out to be an astronaut. So how did that work out for you? How did you end up um, into this? <laughs> That's a really good question. You know, a lot of my um, friends here at NASA grew up dreaming of being astronauts. Um, and for me, that was never a specific goal I had. You know, I grew up aware of what NASA was doing and being inspired by the space program. For me, my focus was on becoming a military officer. And uh, that interest started when I was pretty young, when I was about 13 years old. And so throughout my time in middle school and high school, um, my vision of how that would play out changed a bit. But ultimately, I became really focused on wanting to t attend the Naval Academy. And at the time, I wanted to be a Navy fighter pilot. Um, and then I did end up at the Naval Academy, and during my time there, I was able to meet officers from every community in the Navy and also go actually see those communities in action during the summer between my school years. Um, and those experiences led me to realize that while I was really impressed by the Naval Aviation community, um, that the submarine force would actually be a better fit for my personality and also just the kinds of people that I wanted to work with. And I was super impressed by the sailors in that community uh, because of how smart and driven they were and how team oriented they were. Um, and it really felt like the environment I wanted to be in to develop as a leader and be challenged early in my career because it was my experiences aboard submarines that inspired me to want to apply. Uh, after serving on a submarine and getting the chance to meet an astronaut later, I realized how many parallels there were between the submarine community and living and working in space. And so it was those similarities that allowed me to envision myself working as an astronaut for the first time and drove me to want to apply. So talk about the recruitment process. How did you end up getting selected for this? Um, the recruitment process is a pretty lengthy one. It took about 18 months from submitting my application to finding out that I was selected. Um, but that's because NASA, you know, it has a really thorough process, but a lot of people apply and it takes them a while to get through the application. So uh, NASA announced they were interested in hiring another class right around the time that I first got interested in the program. So I was encouraged by my to my app, even though I was convinced I would never get it, that I was too junior in the Navy, didn't have enough experience yet. Um, and I was really intimidated by the process, but I put my application in. And um, later, a few months later, heard back that I was invited for the first round interviews. So we actually have two rounds of in-person interviews where you come down to Houston for about a week and you do a bunch of medical testing, psychological testing, but also have formal interviews with the selection committee. Um, and so I made it through the first round of the final round and came back to Houston again, um, and then ultimately got the call that I was selected for the 2017 astronaut candidate class. So at this point, are you part of the crew or is this kind of narrowing down the candidates? Um, so the Artemis team is a group of astronauts from which the early Artemis crews might be selected. Um, designated astronauts are going to visit on training for moon missions, but also helping developing the technologies and operational procedures we're going to need to return to the moon. Um, so kind of to your point, it's not a crew assignment, not yet. Uh, it's a little too early to assign astronauts to the Artemis crews specifically, um, but it is an indication that 
um, I'll be preparing one way or another to be a part of the Artemis program, whether that's being on one of the crews or helping support those missions from the ground. Give us an example of what training is like. What are some of the scenarios that you that you train for during this process? Um, we do a lot of training in different dimensions. Some are really close to analogs of what we will do in space, and some are um, more foundational skills that we'll draw upon in a variety of situations. So an example, um, we have this facility called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory here in Houston, and it's a gigantic indoor pool. It's 40 feet deep. Um, it's the largest in indoor pool in the world. And we have a life-size model of the space station submerged in it so that we can go underwater in real spacesuits. And we have a team of scuba divers that helps us simulate a microgravity environment so that we can practice end-to-end -end from the airlock out doing six hours of work and then coming back to the airlock to come inside what a real spacewalk might feel like. And for the moon missions, we're already starting to develop how can we do training that helps us feel like we're in one sixth gravity so we can see how the suit moves in that unique gravity environment, how our tools might work, how we might interact with each other to be most efficient on, say, a geology mission, going out to see what interesting samples we might want to collect. Um, and then the other kind of training I kind of alluded to was training that maybe doesn't apply directly in a one-to-one -one way like that, but helps us be ready for a variety of situations. So an example of that is we fly in an aircraft training jet called the T-38. Um, it's a two-seat uh, jet that the Air Force uses to train its fighter pilots, but we go fly in that routinely as a team of two because it helps us practice making decisions in real time when there's real consequences. You know, you're in a real aircraft, an ejection seat aircraft flying at really fast speeds, and during both normal and off-normal situations, you have to be able to work together to make good decisions and accomplish your mission, but keep you and your buddy safe. Um, so those skills are important because, you know, you know when you're in an analog environment and when you're in a real environment. So that allows us to practice making decisions so that when we're, say, on a lunar lander, we're used to that kind of, you know, high-pressure environment where our training can kick in and we use our procedures and protocols to accomplish our goals. Has there been anything during this training process that's taken you by surprise or, you know, something you weren't that just kind of was unexpected? Uh, that's a good question. Um, a couple of things actually that relate back to the examples I was both talking about. Um, I didn't, you know, know a lot about how we trained for spacewalks. Um, obviously, it's something that really captures your imagination, the chance not only to go to space, but to go out, you know, in a suit on a spacewalk, either on the space station or the surface of the moon, really, you know, motivates me to want to train hard in that environment. And I've been surprised both how challenging it is, but also how fun it is. Um, for me, it's it reminds me of both my background in athletics, um, and it's a team sport. You're out there with a buddy. Um, but also my background in the submarine force and that you have to rely on people with lots of different kinds of expertise to accomplish your tasks. Um, so I really enjoy working in that environment. Um, and then the other big surprise was how much I enjoy flying. You know, I mentioned earlier when we were talking that when I originally joined the Navy, I thought I wanted to be a pilot. And then I actively chose to pursue the submarine warfare community because I thought it'd be a better fit for me. Um, so I didn't have much background in flying airplanes. But now that I get to do it as part of my job, I'm, I understand even more why I was originally drawn to it because it is a lot of fun um, and it's a really cool environment to work in. Um, has there been anything as you trained that has kind of maybe scared you or that you've had to really get used to because you're, it's completely foreign to you? I don't think I've had any situations that have really been scary to me. Um, we work really hard to make sure that our training environments are safe, of course, for everyone involved. Um, but I, I think I have been surprised at how challenging some of our training can be um, working in the spacesuit is really physically demanding. Um, and so maintaining your kind of mental and physical focus for six plus hours <laughs> working in that suit doing really complex tasks is, is really challenging. Um, and I'm not sure I had a great appreciation for that before I got to do it myself. Um, 
And then the other part of our training that I find pretty challenging is learning Russian. You know, we all learn Russian because of our partnership with the Russian Space Agency on the International Space Station. I didn't spend a lot of time learning languages past high school. Um, so picking up a new language as an adult, for me at least, has been quite the challenge. Um, but it's a cool opportunity. It's a cool way to uh, push myself um, in a dimension that I wouldn't really have expected to before I came here. What's the most rewarding part of this for you? What are you most looking forward to? The most re rewarding part for me is definitely being a part of the team here at NASA. I'm a really uh, team-oriented person, and I've always been inspired by the people around me and driven by the people around me and everything that I've done in my career to date. Um, and the NASA has just a really impressive group of people in terms of their expertise and talents, but also they're just amazing human beings, really mission-driven, mission but also on supporting each other. Um, so both my, my teammates here in the astronaut office, but also the larger team at Johnson Space Center who come to work every day and dedicate themselves to human spaceflight. It's just a really exciting group of people to work with, um, and I think that's the part of the job that I find the most fulfilling. So the Artemis moon mission is happening in 2024. When Do they have a launch date yet? No, no specific launch date, although this year we're hoping to launch Artemis 1, which will be the uncrewed test flight of the Orion space capsule. And then in 2022, we're going to put humans on that space capsule for a test flight around the moon. Um, like you mentioned, Artemis 3 will land on the moon in 2024, um, but it's just a little far out at this stage to have a specific launch date in mind. So we haven't been on the moon since, I guess, 1969, right? So this will be the first manned moon mission. What, it, what is the purpose of the mission? Is it just to go to the moon or is there gonna be some further exploration? Um, so we have a lot of objectives in mind that are driving us to want to return to the moon. Um, we have some scientific objectives. Apollo did some amazing work for our understanding of how the moon formed um, and changed over time. And that tells us a lot about the Earth and the other planets in our solar system. Um, so we're excited to return to the moon, but explore new areas that the Apollo astronauts didn't get to visit. Um, so we're looking at some really interesting sites that we could land um, on and do some really interesting geology. But we're also looking toward the moon as a proving ground to understand how we might travel to Mars. Um, a mission to Mars is going to be another giant leap in human space exploration. Uh, it's really far away from home, and the technological and engineering challenges are huge to figure out how to do that safely. So for us, I think in the astronaut office, the moon offers this opportunity to practice for the, that next giant leap of heading to Mars, hopefully in you know 10 20 years from now well kayla it's been a privilege to talk to you um fascinating to be involved with this what's um anything else you want people to know about just to give people an idea of what this is like um you know i having not been to space yet as a rookie um i am really looking forward to having the opportunity to see the planet from a different vantage point uh, from talking to my colleagues who have been in space and have been able to look back on the Earth, I think it really changes the way you see our planet. Continue to be inspired by what NASA is doing and continue to support our missions so that we can maybe one day be standing on the moon looking back at the Earth and getting that unique perspective as well.